All right, there we go. Good morning, and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I'm your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Hi. Um, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event. We're a webinar, webcast, online show. The terminology is up for debate for some people. Um, but whatever you want to call us, we are here live, um, 10 a.m. every Wednesday morning. Um, if you are unable to join us on Wednesday mornings, that's fine. We do record the show every week, though, and then post it on our website. And I'll show you where that is at the end of today's show. So um, if you can't join us on Wednesdays, just go and check out our website and see all of our recordings. Uh, both the show, <coughs> excuse me, the live show and the recordings are free and open to anyone to watch. So um, do share them with your colleagues, um, friends, neighbors, family, anybody you think might be interested in any of our topics that we have on the show. Um, our only real criteria for Encompass Live is that it is something library related, something libraries are doing, something they could be interested in, um, new services or, or software or products we think you might be interested in, um, special programs we're doing here at the Library Commission. Um, so it's all over the place uh, and for all sorts of libraries, uh, public, academic, school, uh, museums, uh, special, correctional, anything, um, we're not really picky except for libraries. <laughs> um, so if people have ideas, they're to email them to you? Absolutely, yes. yeah. If you want to be on the show, or you want us to find someone to talk about something on the show, yeah, send me the send me an email and we'll uh, find something, and we can do it. Um, we do have um, mm -hmm. um, guest speakers that come on the show today, um, on the show sometimes. We also have um, Nebraska Library Commission staff that do sessions, and today we have a mixture of us here. Um, and actually, I'll just hand over to you guys to explain. Um, today's topic is, um, our show is a Library Innovation Studios. Um, a, a new grant option um, for Nebraska libraries, grant opportunity for Nebraska libraries. And I'm just going to hand over to you guys to introduce yourself and um, present what we're uh, going to hear about today. And Joanne, I think you're going to start. Yeah, I think I'll just get started. Today we have uh, four of us from the Nebraska Library Commission who are presenting. Myself, Joanne McManus, and I'm the project manager for the Library Innovation Studios Transforming Rural Communities Project. Um, we also have Rod Wagner, our director, Mary Jo Ryan, Ryan our communications coordinator, Holly Wald uh, in our IT department, and we'll, we'll be very involved in this particular project. And joining us uh, from another location is Connie Hancock, and she is with she's an extension educator out of uh, Kimball in Sydney, and of course she's representing one of our partners in this uh, particular project. So we are. Very glad to have Connie on board today. But this is a grant funded project, and uh, but the opportunity is not necessarily grants. We, uh, the libraries that we will be working with are participating in our grant funded project. And here's a little bit about uh, who is involved. The Nebraska Library Commission applied for a grant through the Institute of Museum and Library Services, and of course that's the Federal Library Agency. And so that we would certainly like to thank them. That is where the funding for the project will be uh, coming from. Nebraska Extension, the University of Nebraska, and the Nebraska Innovation Studio are actually a sub-recipient, and so they will also be having a lot of staff involved in the, in the project, and we are happy to have them on board. And another key partner in this project is uh, the Nebraska Regional Library Systems. And I believe we have at least one library system director uh, online with us today. And we certainly want to thank them. They are going to be helping us uh, work directly with the libraries in their region. And that is going to be a really big asset uh, to our project as we go throughout the three-year project. A little bit about today's agenda. We're going to be talking about uh, project goals. Uh, Rod will be handling that. Project summary, application process, community engagement process, and then we'll be talking about uh, the equipment. And then we're going to be allowing time for questions and answers. And we have a feeling there will probably be quite a few. So um, hopefully we won't go over too long. 
but it's quite possible we will go over our hour. So hopefully that works for people. But we'll try to move along. Yep. And if you do, if we do go over past eleven o'clock, um, we will be recording the whole show. So if you do have to leave from our session because you know you only allotted an hour, um, you'll be always be able to go back and watch the rest of the recording after later. And along the way, um, you can also type in questions to the chat box, and Crystal will bring those to our attention, and we can try to handle those as we go as well. Yeah, or even if you if you have a microphone and you'd rather just yes. speak up, you can just raise your hand, and Crystal mm -hmm. will catch that too. Mm -hmm. Right, and we can yep, we can turn on your microphone if you have one that you want to use. You want to ask your question that way. So, Rod, my three turn. goals. Okay, great. <laughs> Yeah, I, I've been assigned the easy part. Uh, but first of all, I want to add my uh, appreciation to and recognize uh, the Institute of Museum and Library Services for funding this grant. Um, they have given us a great opportunity for this project, and we are very appreciative of that. And also, as Joanne mentioned, our partners, um, we're very excited about uh, the opportunities that they will uh, be involved in in uh, the course of this project. And also, we're very excited about the uh, opportunity to work with uh, up to, well, actually 30 libraries over the course of this project. Um, and uh, we're glad so many are joining us uh, for the program this morning. Uh, libraries are a natural fit for this project um, as places for learning for uh, individual activity, but certainly, um, and importantly for this project, collaborative activity. And that is a, a very important facet of the project. There are, uh, for our project, three goals that were uh, addressed in our project proposal. And the two first ones, um, are the ones most uh, appropriate and important to Nebraska libraries. And that's the opportunity for rural community residents to be uh, engaged in um, activities with the makerspace um, uh, technologies that will be employed in the libraries. Uh, the second being the transformational aspect of the project uh, with particip participatory learning spaces, uh, the community uh, catalyst uh, activity for change, and, and also uh, importantly for uh, the and a basis for funding of the project is that we expect this will be an important model for other libraries uh, beyond Nebraska um, to engage in this type of an activity. Very good. Okay, so let's get to a little bit about the project itself. It is a three-year project. It starts already July 1st, so that's right around the corner, and it'll go through the end of June 2020. <laughs> it would, we were funded with a uh, $530,000 IMLS National Leadership Grant. So obviously, um, we have... Uh, some things that we will need to do with them in mind, for instance, uh, continuous improvement and assessments and whatnot. So you'll see that in our project, uh, both in the Nebraska Library Commission and the University of Nebraska is putting in in-kind match primarily of staff time because this needed to be a one-to-one -one match. So actually it's over a $1 million project when you look at the staff mm -hmm. time provided by the Nebraska Library Commission and university staff. And basically the project uses a library innovation studios or makerspaces hosted by 30 libraries to support community engagement and participatory learning experiences uh, to provide access to learning tools that are not readily accessible to people in the community. So this will be really good for the community um, it's going to be it's going to be really exciting. It's a multifaceted project. There's a lot of pieces to it. Um, in each of the 30 rural and small communities, uh, they will be establishing community action teams and working with that team. 
Uh, nobody, it's hard to do a makerspace by yourself, especially mm -hmm. when it's kind of new to your community. And um, Connie will be talking more about community action teams and that um, community process. We'll be purchasing equipment and components for each of the four rotating uh, studios. And Holly will tell us a little bit more about that later in the hour. We'll be, with the help of the university, they'll be hiring a new instructional design person. And, uh, and we'll have staff, too, that will, can help with this. But we'll be developing instructional materials and an equipment certification process for several of the components. Because some of these machines it won't be real intuitive as far as how to use it. So for on certain particular machines, people who would like to make use of the machine will have to go through um, the video, vignettes, uh, answer some questions, and actually be certified on those particular machines before they can use it. And we'll be working with the libraries uh, for them to have access to that database. So when someone is certified, you can enter their name. And then when they're in your library using that machine, if you don't recognize them as being certified on that particular machine, you can quickly check to see if they are. Otherwise, they would need to go through that certification process. Certainly, we want to employ some sustainability st strategies throughout the way, because hopefully, um, libraries will be interested in this project so they can try um, this type of equipment in their library and if it looks like, hey, this is something that is really um, an interest of the community, we're going to employ those sustainability stri strategies so it's easier for the community to see how they can do this on their own afterwards. We'll be providing equipment training uh, both in Lincoln and uh, locally, focusing on train the trainer strategies. So basically, our staff and partners will be training local people that will actually serve as trainers then locally in the community. And they might not all be library staff, they might be partners and volunteers. Right. And that's one of the reasons for the community action team. We know that the libraries cannot do this by themselves. And how many machines can one person learn? And so you'll want to have a cadre of people and maybe some that will say, okay, that's the machine <laughs> that I want to get to know and love and train on and someone else might want to pick up a different machine. We'll be assisting you with local marketing and programming and event planning. And uh, We'll be talking more about those open houses and maker spaces later on when Mary Jo is talking about um, the, our expectations of the library. And then, of course, we'll also be hosting annual inventor showcases in Lincoln once a year as well, bringing in people from across the state uh, to showcase what they have done. Oh, there's the logic model. There's the logic model. And I know that it's our... Uh. It's hard to see, but when Holly takes you to our website, um, you will see that you have access to this. This is really a nice one-page summary that shows who the partners are um, on the statewide level and then the local partners, and then uh, we do have an advisory panel and what the activities are and what the outcomes are. And This is a nice one-page sheet that you can print off of our website and it's a really good uh, conversation uh, when you're trying to get a whole picture of the project. Um, oh, nice one-page summary of that. Okay, so which libraries are eligible to participate and host a library <laughs> innovation studio? And I hadn't mentioned it before, but those studios, when they rotate into a public library, they will be there up to five months, uh, normally around 20 weeks. Uh, the libraries that are eligible here in Nebraska are public libraries, rural or small accredited public libraries. In Nebraska, uh, because small is a legal service area of less than 25,000, really in Nebraska, all but six communities um, are eligible because of their size. So that's good mm -hmm. news. Almost. That's good. 
almost everybody is eligible that way. We also are asking that uh, the libraries that we work with are accredited. However, uh, the few libraries that are not accredited, we are going to have two different application cycles, and I'll talk about that more later. But if you're not accredited right now and you would like to be one of the 30, um, go ahead and work on accreditation in the next cycle. And um, so you'll be ready to apply when the next cycle opens up. So that means that you need to be in the application cycle that starts in the summer? It would, if is the next um, application for you guys going to be next year? 2018. 2018. Right. So you want to be, um, news be coming soon from me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> from That's something I do. Um, library accreditation now. Um, yes, yeah, so we're working on getting all that information together to reach out to everybody who's potentially eligible to be accredited. So you need to work on it and get that done. Um, our deadline for having it all finished up is October of this year for your accreditation and then you'll be all set to next year apply in the second round of the grant on um, this grant yeah um, so that's for if you are not accredited or you're working to maintain your accreditation too you got to keep that up I assume too yep. like yeah, lose it. yeah. <laughs> right okay so what are the benefits of participation uh, as far as that community engagement process we're going to have you'll have access to training tools templates and support from uh, the partners, uh, whether it's the Nebraska Library Commission, Extension Educators, and of course our um, regional system uh, directors and staff out there. You'll have access to studio components for a 20-week period. I think that's the biggie. You can, tr you can try it before you buy it. And I guess that's our next line, isn't it? And of course, uh, what's nice is that your community can also see firsthand benefits of the makerspace. Sometimes it's hard, and I know sometimes when I talk to people about makerspaces, they look at me and say, what's a makerspace? And you might find that in your own community when you start to talk to people. But certainly, if they have already seen it, and later on you're talking about adding some makerspace equipment, They've already seen it. They know what you're talking about. Uh, they probably saw the benefits, which is really nice. Uh, we're going to try to do some travel support when uh, your staff and, uh, and volunteers come to Lincoln for training or, that, um, uh, or other events in Lincoln. Obviously, we're going to be letting you know closer to those dates how we can support you there. You'll have access to project staff and project partners, uh, which hopefully will be an asset to you. You'll have a connection to the Nebraska Innovation Studio and Makerspace Network. And I think if you really carry on this Makerspace idea, that will be important for you. And um, at the end of our grant, uh, the 30 participating libraries will be eligible to receive one or more pieces of equipment that we had used in the project. So uh, that will be a plus too. Now what are the benefits for libraries not working in, um, not participating? There will be some benefits for those as well because as we go along and we develop uh, training and certification processes and um, instructional videos on how to use particular machines, those will be accessible to all. So if there's a library that already has a pretty robust makerspace, they'll be able to get access to all of our training materials and templates and be able to be certified and badged as a certified user of the embroidery sewing machine or whatever it is. Right. Okay. So in terms of expectations, I think that's probably what a lot of people uh, sitting in the audience are wondering right now. Um, I guess one of the, the big things is that we do expect that you organize a community action team and engage local organizations. And like yesterday we were talking about this with Extension and we're very aware that every community is different and that we will be meeting each community where you're at. I mean obviously some of you have already organized community action teams. You're already deep into the community action and community change efforts in your communities. It all just depends on where you're at but we want to this to be a growth experience in the area of libraries serving as community catalysts or community anchor organizations. 
So we we'll want you to identify staff and recruit volunteers to attend the train the trainer sessions, both in Lincoln and locally. Um, we want you to prepare space and gather up some tables, chairs, and consumables, and we'll talk more about that as Holly gets into it. But um, a lot of times, uh, it, the space you have might be more flexible than you think. Let me just say that, and Holly will go into more detail. Um, we, uh, we expect libraries to make studio components available to the public on a regular basis, so this isn't just something you put in your meeting room and only have open on Friday nights. Um, it's going to be a more active 20 weeks of really programming and bringing groups together, and, and it'll be fun, I think. A lot of fun things will be able to happen in your library during those weeks. Um, assist with user certification. That's what Joanne was talking about, where uh, individuals who are going to be using the, the equipment will need to be certified in some of the equipment, not all of it, but some of it. And um, we, we will have, be using the Library Innovation Studios um, profile system, which basically, Joanne described, you get to certify somebody based on their being trained, either through videos or online training. Um, and they, or I guess there'll be some individual options, you know, one-on-one -on -one too. But then they then they're certified, and it's on it's it's on the in the database, and you can see if someone comes in if they're certified or not. Um, we'll encourage users in your library to showcase their creations and inventions, and I think this is a wonderful opportunity for people to just let their imaginations run wild because there's probably people in your community who have business uh, entrepreneurs who have business ideas, you know, just a lot of different things that can come out of people being able to get together and, and learn and bounce ideas off each other. Um, we expect libraries to assist us with survey distribution and collection of data. And that includes helping us gather stories from people. Uh, if somebody does uh, do something in the studio that leads to a business, we're going to want to interview them and get them front and center and, and show that this is how these things happen in our communities. Um, and then, of course, we want you to continue to work with your action team, either sustain, not either, sustaining your uh, makerspace, but also other initiatives that grow and spin off from this. I just want to say, too, uh, if you have any questions, please do raise your hand. We are, you know, we can interrupt our flow here at any time to visit with you about anything that interests you, or also, if you can type it into the chat box, um, Krista will okay. Too. Yeah, if you have any one more more details about any of this, um, we do have one just a little comment. A comment. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, from Gail Irwin from Ainsworth, she just says at the very beginning, she said, just wanted to thank you for applying for this grant and being awarded it. What an exciting time for Nebraska libraries. Oh, thank you, Gail. Gail. We, we do yes. agree. It's, it, I think it's going to be fun and exciting. And Joanne's got this kind of well organized as to how this is all going to lay out over the next three years. So you want to talk about the Hosting periods, I, I sure will. Um, we have uh, set up seven hosting cycles. We do have uh, four innovation studio kits. And so what, uh, as we uh, schedule libraries in the different hosting cycles, then before a, a hosting cycle kicks off, we'll bring the people from those particular four libraries in to do training in Lincoln. And then after that, soon after that, then we will uh, go out and set up the equipment in those four libraries, probably a couple weeks apart, so we can make sure that each library gets a good start before we uh, take the equipment to the next ones. Uh, each of those um, hosting periods will be generally 20 weeks in duration, so that's how long you'll have the equipment in your community. Um, Obviously, our staff will install those five studios and then do train the trainer training again locally in that first week that it's in your community. Again, we're training trainers, not all your citizens in your community, but certainly you might have people in your community that are willing to be trained and then come in and help with the training along the way. So, And I bet people who are out in the audience are thinking of those folks right now who would be just a terrific... Um, assistant and who would give a 20-week window of volunteer time to help somebody learn how to use the embroidery sewing machine or to use that uh, router or right, things. right, so right, there's right. You'll you'll 
think of people as you are working in your communities. <clears throat> and um, I guess we got all that done. Application. So let's talk about that application process. I'm sure you've all had a chance to look at that. I emailed that uh, two different times to Nebraska Libraries. Um, it is <laughs> also now up on our website, and Holly will show you where that is in a little bit. But that um, you do need to apply by the deadline, the first opportunity. The deadline is the end of the day on Monday, July 10th. During that cycle, we will probably select somewhere between 12 and 20 libraries to participate. And you can submit that application either via email or mail if that's your preference. And then there will be a second application period, and that will be sometime in 2018. We have not selected a date. It will probably depend on whether we're closer to having picked 12 libraries or 20 <laughs> libraries. And the reason why we have uh, split this up into two application cycles is because we thought at any given time there are libraries that their director has just retired or is knows that they will be retiring before this comes to their library or what other transitional things you might have going on. A new building. And, and so not mm -hmm. everybody um, is willing to commit at any one time. And so hopefully we'll catch all those libraries that are really excited and ready to go. And then hopefully sometime in 2018 when we come back to collect to get our uh, last few libraries, then there will be library directors that will have been up and running for a year or so and will feel confident that they are ready also to get into the process. And that, that midnight, just for people like me who do things at the last minute, that's midnight central time? Uh, oh, yes, midnight central time, yeah. yeah. So 11 So if you're, if you're still working <laughs> on it, you get an extra hour. <laughs> no, I'm you don't. Asking. You, if, it, if, it, if it's 11... 59 their time, that'll be fine too. Okay. <laughs> I'm not going to be here at midnight to pull the no, plug on no. my computer. <laughs> it's, it's midnight Just somewhere. Somebody, yes, yeah. if it's midnight somewhere, <laughs> we're fine. It's always midnight somewhere. If you're in Hawaii when you're doing the application, you get lots of extra time. And for, and for those of you who have looked at the application itself, you'll find that there's just a basic comp. Uh, contact information that you fill in. On the bottom of the first page is, page is an assurance checklist and what that is is a list of things that are basically requirements that we want you to read and check if you are willing to do that and we'll see that in just a bit. There are uh, 10 questions to answer. Um, those questions are just, you know, type in whatever your answer is. There's only one that ask you to actually submit something other than uh, your written answer and that is on uh, where in your library you think you'll be putting these components. Uh, we do ask for you to send in some sketches or diagrams. Uh, we don't want to put you through a lot of trouble. If you need to just sketch it out by hand, that is per perfectly fine. You don't need to uh, you don't have to have an architect have that up. Yeah. <laughs> but another thing you can do, too, is take photographs or just walk around with a video and video sections of your library. All that would be helpful to, for us to just get an idea how it would work for you. Right. And then we also ask that you attach letters of support and commitment from potential local partners. We don't expect that you have your community action team all put together or anything like that. But we do would like you to reach out and talk to your Chamber of Commerce and Extension Educator and maybe your economic developer or some educators, people that you think might be able to help you in this process and ask them to uh, provide you with a letter of support and commitment. And that's what the assurances checklist looks like. Right. So it's just really straightforward. Um, you just read that. And uh, if you agree with those, go ahead and check yes, and that's all you need to do there. Uh, also attached to that application form 
at the end you will see an optional hosting period priority form and uh, this is not required it's an optional form that you can fill out if you want to fill out this form but can't make it by the deadline this form can be filled out and filled in at a later date if you would like uh, if you never volunteer to fill out that form and are selected to be one of the 30 uh, participating libraries, you'll get the form <laughs> at some point or we'll visit with me one-on-one -on -one about talking about when you when it would be easy best for you to uh, host that mm -hmm. makerspace in your community. The advantage of doing it in the beginning is allow you to be one of the, among the first to request what hosting cycle fits with you. So that's a benefit to you, but certainly, you know, I would spend more time on the application if you only have so much time and less on this. And this is a good time to, to think about what's going to be different in your library. For example, if you know that you're in the middle of a remodel or you will be in the middle of a remodel, you might want to schedule out and say, once the library is remodeled, we'll have this kind of space. So again, it just gives you a chance to think ahead. Right. We do have a question. Um, I'm not sure if you're going to be addressing this. They're more about the technical issues. Um, what kind of networking, electrical load, that kind of thing. Are you going to get into the details of what the different components might need? Um, we won't get into the weeds, but Holly will probably mention that. Okay. And we do have a website that's got some of that information on it, too. It's the technical specifications, well, basically. Related to the equipment. Yeah. Right. To the equipment. Yeah. 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 We'll, we'll get that. All right. We'll get into that in a little bit. And this is what that priority cord form looks like. Right, and you will see all uh, seven cycles on there. We're hoping in this first bunch that we can fill at least the first two cycles, but if, even if you want to be toward the end of the project because you know you have that building remodel or something coming up and you want to do it after that, it's okay to, to apply this first cycle but still say, yeah, you want to be toward the end. And so uh, but I do want to point out that even though we have like the weeks of those trainings and the weeks of the installations and when we pick up the equipment, this is really very tentative because it'll depend on when we're really ready to do that first training. I think now um, if, if we could ask Connie to um, give us a, a little bit of information about the community engagement piece. Sure, I, I'd be glad to. Uh, and thank you for asking me to be part of the um, webinar today because I do think as um, the librarian from Ainsworth mentioned, this is really an exciting time to be in Nebraska. We've got a lot of uh, partners not only thinking about makerspace, but um, the whole concept of rural and how we can make rural um, a better place for people to live and work and play. And so. I think the makerspace fits into that larger community prosperity uh, conversation around how do we attract young people back to our communities, how do we attract young families to our communities, um, how do we look at economic opportunities in a different way, uh, maybe from more of an entrepreneurial perspective, and then that whole quality of life um, component, and I think a makerspace fits into that because as we look at what a makerspace has to offer, um, not only the kind of equipment um, that we have available to us um, in a different kind of a way, but the whole network piece that brings people together uh, in one place to have conversation and to um, learn from each other. So the engagement piece, I think, from a librarian uh, perspective is really for you guys to think about your role as a catalyst and uh, getting people involved, uh, getting people to work together, and getting people to use their talents in a different kind of a way. And I think that's um, people in today's world really want to be part of something, but oftentimes we have to ask that they're, um, for their involvement. And so that really takes a different um, uh, role uh, from a, a library director perspective. Um, the, the engagement piece really builds a sense of community. And as I mentioned, um, this is a place where people can meet um, to do something different uh, than, than what you normally would do and to learn from each other. And then to, to really understand the benefits of a makerspace to the whole community. 
it's not just about the library because it brings in that whole community piece. So as you think about um, the piece of economic opportunities, as you think about um, attracting young families or young folks to the community, how can we get their involvement into that makerspace um, component? And then the idea of creating a strong community action team. And I think there's different models in that whole arena of creating a different action team and what that looks like. And so um, the next slide, I think, kind of really focuses in on uh, what that action team could be. And I've got a couple of examples of two communities that I've been working in, and um, I'll, I'll talk about them. Um, but really think about five to six community people, uh, community leaders, that would have somewhat of a passion around this concept of a makerspace. And um, representatives from a diverse part of your community. So Chamber of Commerce, Economic Development, Education, Extension, Business. Um, the Art Guild is a great uh, place where people like to create things. Um, the Quilt Guild might be one where there would be somebody in there that would have a um, strong leadership component and um, would be willing to take some time over this period where you'll be um, having um, hosting the rotating maker uh, rotating uh, studio for that time frame. So the two two um, communities that I've been working in is one is Sydney and the other one is Ravana and um, I see Sherm is on on the webinar today and um, I really applaud his leadership role from the uh, Sydney Create uh, Makerspace. We've uh, we've gone through about a year and a half conversation of what does this look like? Who do we all involve? Um, and it, we did include early on um, our ESU, um, our public school principal, because he he understands the need for a makerspace from a high school um, education perspective. We included the community college um, because they've got um, avenues and venues that can can help be part of that. Economic development was part of the uh, conversation as well. And lately then we've added the Art Guild. But during this time frame, we've been through several conversations and we wanted to really help market that. So we do have a mission and a vision statement. Um, we've titled our makerspace Sydney Create. Uh, now, I don't know that you all have to go to that length of uh, where you want to be, but we have a big dream um, in Sydney about what that makerspace should be. And so we're, re I think, having uh, the rotating space and showing people what this tangible concept looks like is really um, going to be beneficial to the community to show that it's more than um, a bunch of equipment and I can go and create things. Um, so um, that's one aspect. In Ravana, um, they're the economic development and the chamber director, in conjunction with the, the librarian, are working together now to say, what does this makerspace mean? And the economic developer there is really a driver from this perspective. And um, it's kind of exciting to see their passion that they, that they understand that rural uh, communities need a place where people can come and create and uh, network together. So those are two different aspects and two different models. And so however it works for your community to bring people together to have this conversation, um, I think is um, fine. It, there's no one, one set way to be able to do it. But as you look at people that you want to include in your uh, maker, in your action team, you need to have people who are willing to make a commitment, um, spend some time, some energy, some of their talent to focus on the strategic conversation that you need to take and create that implementation plan of what using these kinds of tools and hosting these kinds of tools, what does that look like and how do we get people involved in that? We also need to be able to engage and collaborate with uh, the community and key stakeholders. and so. Uh, in, the, in our Sydney situation, Sherm and I have gone to some of the banks in town uh, to do a presentation. We've gone to the Chamber of Commerce to do presentations so that they begin to are, become aware of 
what um, opportunities exist if we have um, makerspace in the community. Um, one of the things that your action team is going to have to do is, as, as Joanne mentioned, we, I don't think that the library alone can do this. And so how do you go out and recruit others and their organizations to serve as trainers um, and or participants? Um, I don't know that even from the library and or extension, we have the capacity to be able to do that alone. So there's other people in our communities that have expertise and talent. And so let's lean on them uh, because they will then have greater buy-in into this whole concept that if you in fact have a physical space at some point in time, that would be um, uh, the ideal situation in tr moving this forward. Um, we also want to work with the community to find additional resources. And, and that may not be right off the bat. Um, as you put in this application, it may be a thought process of uh, down the road when you're hosting some of this to think about what additional financial um, pieces are out there, what other human talent is out there, what other ideas from a makerspace. Uh, Dr. Shane Farader was in Ravana on Monday night um, speaking to a, a community group of about 50 people about the Innovation Studio and about makerspace um, in Ravana. And one of the questions was asked, have you thought about culinary? Um, our community is a, has great cooks. And so what does that look like as we think about a local foods initiative and or some culinary pieces along with that. So you may not have a kitchen in the library, but it may be something that as, as you think about it, um, are part of that. Um, I do want to mention that um, Dr. Shane Ferreter has this hub and spoke um, concept that the innovation studio on campus is the hub and that we have multiple communities across the state be part of that spoke. And so as Joanne mentioned, the partnership we will have access to um, expertise from campus that can go back and forth because of the technology that we have available in meetings like this um, where we can actually be sort of face-to-face -face, um, in a, a, a Zoom room or a video conferencing room. Um, we did one, one other little thing about the Sydney piece. We did a small kickoff. Um, so something between now and when you actually host um, your um, uh, uh, the rotating makerspace. We did a, a two-hour kind of a kickoff, um, thinking about what could we showcase. And we had the art guild uh, come in. We did a little bit of videography stuff. Um, Sherm had the 3D printer going, and just showcasing some of the things that we had currently available in a small kind of a way uh, to get it kicked off so that when we do bring it, um, hopefully bring it to um, the library, then people have a, at least an, a semi idea of what's going on. One of the things Ravana is doing at their um, festival this summer is having a maker, maker fair. And so it'll be a kind of a, another two hour kind of a event um, in the park and they're inviting people who are inventing things, who are making things currently to come showcase that uh, during that time frame during Anavar. So those are some things that as you think about this summer, the rest of the summer and into your application, they, they might be some things that you could quickly turn around to get some additional community involvement and engagement into that. So I, that's my piece I think on the community engagement. Um, concept. I, I think everybody, everybody has a different take on it, but these are some of the key pieces that I think really need to um, need to think about as you create your action team. Thank you, Connie. And uh, all of you, if you have questions or comments for Connie, please do raise your hand or type it in the chat box and we'll move on to equipment, but we can still talk more about community action and community engagement as we move on. And Holly, you're going to take us right through that, huh? I'm gonna I'm gonna do my best. Okay. <laughs> Greetings from me, Holly, and um, I'm excited to be a part of this uh, grant and uh, continue to be involved in uh, um, aspects of grants at the Library Commission. Working with Joanne, we we've done some fine things together over the years, and, and our, I really our remaining uh, core be talked to. <laughs> yes, and so so um, but. Uh, 
recently I've been working with Craig, who is also on um, our staff here, and on behalf of this grant, and trying to look for recommendations and coming up with uh, selections of equipment or components to be included in the Innovation Studio kits for the, um, for the libraries as part of this grant. And we've also been working with uh, Jerry Reef, who is the shop manager at the Nebraska Innovation Studios on UNL campus. And I think that I um, can't emphasize enough that he will be bringing a lot of knowledge about use of equipment as he's been working in the trenches with equipment similar. We're probably a little smaller size, but that same type of equipment. Um, at uh, the Innovation, uh, Nebraska Innovation Studios. Um, hoping to, um, our plan would be to purchase the equipment sometime around the beginning of July when the money starts flowing from the grant. And um, for the purpose of the budget um, allocation for the grant, we did identify uh, components already that we believe we will be purchasing. Um, but you'll see throughout on our web pages that it's a possibility that we may change maybe the vendor who's supplying that particular type of equipment along the way, depending on what's um, available and what's best in pricing. Um, so that's just something I wanted to mention. Um, one of the big things is, of course, we're talking about small and rural libraries and, and talking about um, the space considerations. And you can see here we've got quite a list of different items that we're going to be um, focusing on with equipment. And if you're, if you're looking at that, you can see some of those pieces, like the digital fabrication pieces. They're, they're going to be some pretty big pieces of equipment in your library. And um, so what we've done is, uh, looking through the items here, we've made a decision to break down our, um, go ahead and move forward, break down our equipment list into two different areas. We have what we call stations, and in that case, you have items that are groupings together and require a certain amount of space and we're thinking that those will be pretty permanent in your library for reasons that we'll address shortly. Or we have what we call mobile stations and they may more likely be uh, smaller kits types of things where you're building a, a circuitry um, or perhaps you're doing a, a project that's um, um, like using uh, electronics for um, small clothing pieces or anything like that, uh, that we would, you'd have a table that you'd lay out to be able to, to work on that project. So when we're talking about the, the actual stations, they're permanently located, like I said, for about a 20-week period. And these stations, um, for the reason being that they're permanently located is the weight and perhaps the sensitivity of uh, moving the equipment. And they may need to be what's you know recalibrated by measurement um, every time they get moved, and uh, that may require some expertise to come in to help you with that. So when you're thinking about uh, where you're putting your equipment, these this is what we're calling our stations, and we'll get to those shortly. And then with the mobile pieces, that would be something that you could even have somebody come in who wants to just check it out uh, for themselves to work with, or if you have a program. You may need um, just a table, small or larger table, to work with for that. Um, and let's see, if we'll go to the, the website. OK, we've got just kind of a list here. And then I, um, oh, yeah. no, actually, if you hit escape, you can get out. And then do you want to go to the website? The website's open. So yeah. th this is, yeah, this is basically, uh, yeah. So to get to the website, um, you can go under grants right here where it says Library Innovation Studios Project. If you forget that, you can just type in, uh, if you can type, Maker Spaces, and that, it'll take you right to it, to a link to it. So anyway, through the grants, we go to Library Innovation Studios Project, and here we are at the page. And what we're looking at is in the, the gray box, we're looking at the equipment components. And just to have a conversation, what Craig and I decided to do, go ahead and click on it. Um, there's a lot of information related to this. And we also, as I stated before, we're not sure if this is exactly the vendor or the product that we will be using. But at this point in time, this is what we're thinking we will be purchasing. And we wanted to give you an opportunity. And we're thinking that. For some of you, you may not even know what some of these things are. We and that's okay. I didn't. <laughs> and that's okay. I guess that was what I'd like to say. So um, we put together um, 
little um, little pages which include uh, a template if you'll just click on any one of them um, and, and here we're looking at uh, a station we have the five different stations in this particular station if you'll scan down you uh, you can see that there's an explanation a little bit about the station and then we talk about what are the components or the pieces of equipment and so you have your 3D printer, you see a 3D scanner over on the right, and then you have your actual desktop computer. You have the, the measurements in particular of each one of those devices, and then you would have a recommended amount of space that um, you would want to have available, and again, stress permanently. And then, of course, the, the critical considerations that you also have, if you'll scroll back down again, um, things that you might want to know in your library that the 3D printer does emit some odor and you may want to place it somewhere where you have a, a good circulation or um, maybe you want to isolate it. I, I don't know, you know what, what your decision making is there, but, but at least you have that criteria and that should be important to you as you're making a decision um, when you're working with a grant. And if for some reason any of that critical um, considerations is something you're not really sure what to do about, please contact Janet, or Janet, Joanne, or myself, and uh, we can visit with you about that. And don't let that be a showstopper for you as far as applying for the grant. Be sure that you have a visit with us. And then the next part of the template tells, shows you what you, can, what you can make with it. And then the best part is the video where you can either, in some cases, it's just more of a descriptive piece on each one of these uh, identifying pieces. Is the components is a, just a description of what, what the item is, and in some cases they're actually doing maker things on the video. And so if we go back one, oh, it's over here. No, we can just slide up, I'm sorry. This is brand new, by the way. The, the, web, the web page is just about uh, like, three days old. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, so, and, and so it's again, night, it, <laughs> it, may, it may even change again. But, but again, if you, if you look here, there are the five stations. Let's just open up another one. I don't think so another really... station. We've got the Burnett Embroidery Machine. I can think of some businesses that might get started based on how this works for them. So, um, so if you go down, then you can get a little bit of information. What I love about this is, um, and we need to give Craig full credit for this, putting this piece together with a template, but um, if you're not able to use words or to share, or if you don't understand it first, you see it, but this is so great because you can go out into your community and you can share this with anybody. and, and you know, have an enthusiasm begin in the community even before the get-go because they'll have some ideas of the kinds of things they'll be able to do in the makerspace. So again, we have five stations. These would be these items as you look um, through the, um, the pages will show what components need to be set together, how much space they're going to take, the critical considerations, if you scroll down a little, uh, that you may need to be concerned about and in this case um, you have to worry about that you need to have some kind of uh, air duct or something to remove the particles from the product out of the window and you may go oh I don't know how to do that one thing I was thinking is if you have a maintenance person in your library or somebody who deals with that they may have some ideas that you you don't think about so uh, don't be afraid to ask questions or share this with other folks to see if there's um, a way to get things done so then the other part of that is we talked a little bit about those um, mobile stations and that would be more of an item that you have say um, you have in a secure area in the library you know whether it's behind the circulation desk or in a closet that's in a tote or a box and um, these are things that are more of the design of just you know circuitry or um, some type of activity that you would be doing together in a group or individually mm -hmm and you would be able to just have a table and the space would be dependent upon how many people are engaged in it. So in general, that's kind of what, uh, you know, I, I could spend time, but we're really running out of time on each individually, but I encourage you to go out, take a look at the site and see, um, see more about the different components that are making up the actual studios. One thing again is to emphasize is the, the fact that to, you don't have to have a contiguous space to put. Oh yeah, that's a good point. That you don't need a contiguous space to put these items in your library. 
you may have one area for a station that works well. You know, your considerations are going to be outlets and Ethernet um, ports because you're going to need to be able to be uh, connected, wired to do some of these things. But you may have two different areas at work, but not one big area. Don't worry about it. Make those choices about using those two different areas. Or this is a good example of one that may not be set up all the time because, you know, right. you might have certain times when you're going to do video work. And mm -hmm. it, it might be in your meeting room. You might right. set it up in your meeting room for a certain time. So this would, yeah, this would be more of the, the, a station activity that could be mobile or something, too. We do have some questions now about the different stations and sure. being made available. Sure, And there's the first one about, um, is networking needed at computer access or electrical load requirements? So it's yeah, going to vary. That's in there. It's, so all yeah, that information it's included is in the here. Right. That's, Why yeah. and you can see the station. The station I can't see them Station one here. or something. Okay, so here it's it will say how many electrical outlets you need because here you're plugging in both the router. So in those words, it says mm -hmm. that you will need a hardwired uh, internet access port um, and that there's two devices in this particular station that need to be plugged in. Now we're not... We don't um, we didn't have an issue with wattage. We, I did, we looked into equipment like any kind of, if you're that doesn't seem to be a problem with any of it. So if you okay. had a concern about that. But all the details are here on the site for each particular station. In each particular okay. station. So that like this one would require, as Joanne said, the internet access and ideally that would be a hardwired port mm -hmm. and the plugs where the and thing I just showed before doesn't require that. It no. requires electricity to for right. the light. So I would encourage you to to go out and read this because this will this will have your fine details. One thing that we did put together, if you'll go back to the grade area, uh, kind of a, a quick uh, spreadsheet as far as space allocation for you back one more. Yeah, oh, I know where we're going. Yeah. We're going to the beginning. Now, yeah. let's do it this way. And there we go. Here. So at the very space bottom needs, down there, you have chart. This uh, chart here will be helpful for you as you try to maybe sit down and, and actually have a working section session in your library trying to figure out where everything can fit in um, and be very useful for you. Um, uh, the content of the other pages is, is much more involved, but this is the quick and dirty. And, and the other thing I would encourage people to think about is repurposing space within the library. Um, you may have had certain areas in your library forever um, certain reading areas and that kind of thing, but it might be that for 20 weeks your that space could be repurposed and we would be happy to consult with you and work with you on how to repurpose those spaces if you're interested. Um, I, I just think we're really asking everyone to put on your creative thinking caps and take, take a real hard look at your library. I think the important thing that we realize is that libraries don't have a lot of extra space and um, we do want to, even though it'd be nice to have a lot of nice space, we know that the smaller libraries are going to, and it's not necessarily in smaller towns. I mean, some libraries are just smaller than others. And we really do want to work with you if you are interested in this project. So we will really, you know, hopefully you'll, say, okay, well, we got a corner over there that's a five by five foot space. We can stick something there. We got another corner over there. We can stick something there. And it's not that you need a 20 by 20 foot room. Right. Okay. Um, questions? Yes, we have a bunch of questions more about this too. Um, <laughs> a couple of people are asking well, the, um, about the consumable, consumable materials that are needed for all these, the filament for the 3D printer, embroidery thread, the um, sewing machine, um, the actual totes or things for them to embroider on, is the library going to be responsible of that or is that all provided as part of the grant? So uh, we true. will be providing... Um, Do we switch? Okay. Oh, we're having the, the musical <laughs> chairs here. <laughs> we will here be, comes Joanne. We will be providing uh, filament and thread and some um, things like some wood, some fabric, because certainly when we come in and do our training, we're going to need stuff like that to work with. As far as, and then we're hoping that we'll, and we'll have a list of things that people have around their house, and hopefully you can have kind of a consumable drive. So we'll have a list of stuff that might be uh, good to gather. 
So we might have a list that says certain kind of fabrics or certain kind of pieces of wood that people might have laying around would be fine for them to gather. Um, however, you can also ask the people that are working on projects that if they want to build uh, furniture, furniture or birdhouses <laughs> or whatever, that they really are responsible for bringing in their own things. Now, some libraries won't necessarily have a, a lumber store or a fabric store, and so in those communities it might be nice to at least have a few things laying around. We will be supplying some. We'll ask, be asking the libraries to try to collect others, not necessarily purchase, but try to collect others, and then of course the users uh, will need to be part of the community well. engagement too. Right. I know a lot of libraries do for their summer reading programs or any sort of their craft related uh, programming ask for donations of materials from the local community. So it could be along the same lines as that. Do right. the same thing for some of this depending on what you're doing. Um, we are running over a little bit. I hope everybody's okay with that. We're just going to yeah, keep answering going. questions. Yep. Um, we'll stick with this for right now and then go back to another one I have. Um, a couple of questions are that concerned about the uh, ventilation and the air quality and whatnot. Um, Sherm actually asks, says um, that ventilation is going to be an issue for a lot of locations. Um, could the equipment requiring it be purchased with a filtering system? Is there anything like that available? And then someone else also mentioned that uh, Donna Cruz at a conference she saw um, uh, air scrubbers that were uh, uh, used with some of these kind of equipment. Um, is that something that could be added or is... Yeah, we, have, we haven't we have exhausted our search on the types of equipment that might help us with that. That does add expense. Yes. Yes, it's and, um, and what we're going to try to do is try to identify those that even though they're more expensive would work better and then maybe see if we can also get some partners that might kick in or maybe manufacturers that just would give us some of those things. And Joanne's pretty lucky with that. She's already gotten those sewing machines free. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's so awesome. we are going to be or looking, donated. We, donated. We are going to be looking into that and hopefully we will be able to come up with something that isn't an issue in libraries. But we do think that it's quite possible that we might need on that one machine might need to try to vent it to an outside window. We would certainly be providing the hose. We would ask you in advance, well, what size of window do you have, so we can, you know, bring in a, you know, have a piece of yeah, so one of those something laser, that laser already cutter. One of them said, we'll, yeah, we'll provide right. what you need to I mean, get it out. And we're not going to say that you guys have to figure out how to get it out that window. We are going to be working with you to do that. But yes, we are looking at scrubbers and other things, and hopefully, we can afford what we need. Okay, so we'll work with you on that, um, how to make that happen. We'll find a solution. Yeah. Because um, someone says, now what if our windows don't open? Uh, well, talk to us and we'll figure yeah. it out. We'll see what can be done. <laughs> <laughs> um, equipment damage. What? Who is responsible for equipment damage? Do we need any additional insurance, right? You are sure. You'll all? be buying that equipment out of your salary. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> Sorry. Um, you know, we haven't uh, really talked about that much yet. Hope, you know, we would hope that uh, if, let's say, if something was stolen, um, that, you know, you would first check with the, the insurance that you have and see if that covers it. Um, but we are, we're going to be looking into that in more detail and we'll be I assume some of the equipment has some sort of warranties or something yes, anyway yes, for yes, regular yeah. wear and yes. tear or and things and, that happen. And yeah. we are buying extended, extended warranty. Yeah. So nice. if something really does break, we can get that fixed and repaired and replaced. And um, we know things are going to break mm -hmm. and we'll just have to deal with it. So don't worry about it. We'll Wait, it. We're, we'll I, work it I don't, out. we're not going to be sending the library a bill. <laughs> <laughs> um, and here's something that may be uh, very, what levels of supervision will be required? It's going to vary from thing, item to item, I suppose. It really is. And depending on what you're doing for programming. 
to be determined. That's a hard <laughs> question to answer because as you look at this equipment, you know, yeah. and you've got, for example, an embroidery machine here, and you've got a person who's certified mm -hmm. on it, and right. they've they're right. in the profile. You can see they know how to use it. How much supervision do you really need to give them? I think you know? they should get more into that the train the trainer sessions that we come and teach about these different things. You'll you'll figure out right. Well, and also if you're just going to be like, yeah, here's the here's someone who's been trained and knows how to use it, you're good on your own, great. As opposed to we're doing a program for a couple hours and teaching you how to do the makey makey, right? Right. We're going to have another, someone running that, so it's going to yeah. yeah and depend. another consideration is um, if we were talking about donating, and um, I, to let you know at the uh, um, Nebraska Innovation Studios, they actually run all of their wood through a metal detector before they use oh. it because they're worried about having any kind of nails or anything metal in it. And so, you know, I've had a couple nights I've been wondering about that myself, <laughs> how we're going to manage that piece of it. You know, we'd have to, um, almost the donation would have to be brand new and certified because what happens is if you uh, have a machine that's as sophisticated as that and it is broken and has a piece that's broken and it's in a rural area, it can take a little bit of time to get that fixed and our our goal would be to have already some of those most likely parts and pieces that uh, could be broken um, and maybe have a supply of them. Right. Um, and so. generally what's going to be broken if you would come across a nail in a board is the, it the bit that mm -hmm. breaks and that bit could be an 80 or $100 bit. Right. Expensive. And it could be hard to find. It, yeah, or having are. somebody to right. actually do the, the installation. And in fact, just as an aside, um, we at the Innovation Studios, when we were there a little bit a uh, month or so ago, they had their CNC router was working, and they're talking about they're actually going to have a vending machine there um, on site that you can purchase bits, et cetera, um, for their patrons that come in, or the users, the makers that come in to purchase right there, because if they don't have it and they're there with a project, then you know, then they got to run to the store. Have to wait to run to the store. Right. So I mean, there's, there's. I don't believe we'll have a vending machine traveling with no, us. No, no. But, but anyway, it's possible that we may have a complement of, of bits that are available for some of this. Right, so. and if and if bits break, we will be replacing right replacing them. Right. Um, but we realize that if you have a piece of equipment in that corner and a piece of equipment in that corner and the piece of equipment over in that back room, the that's still available to the public, that you can't have your eyes on all those pieces of equipment at any one time. And you don't need to. So um, we're not requiring that you do. Uh, we realize something could happen to a machine, and um, you know, we'll take it in stride. <laughs> Other questions? These are all good yeah. questions. Um, actually, we have a question for Connie. Um, <coughs> Going back to um, when you were working with Sydney and Ravenna, um, someone wants to know is did Sydney or Ravenna do any kind of survey to see what kind of equipment the community was looking for or wanted? Uh, we have not <laughs> done that um, at this point in time, but I think that's something that very well could be the action team uh, responsibility to kind of um, <coughs> scan the community, see what um, of interest there is and um, but no we have not done the true survey of what that looks like uh, we tried to do that within the school system um, but it didn't it you know it just didn't materialize we've talked about it but haven't gotten that far to get it actually done one way to gather that kind of information at this point um, without doing a quote-unquote survey if you're going out to meet as part of your community action team and stakeholder building, if you're going out to meet with groups, you can have a, like a two-question focus group while you're there mm -hmm. and that asks the question, uh, what, what do people want to do here? Uh, what, or, or what, I mean, I'm, I'm not coming up with the right question, but you know, a question about what would be useful to our community? What would help our community grow? What would help our entrepreneurs? So that can be done as part of your community action team. You're not getting a survey, but at least you are getting that kind of information. And I bet you're getting it anyway, aren't you, Connie? People are telling you what they think. <laughs> right, right. Well, you know, the 3D printer was it was easy. The video um, 
component was easy. We had purchased, we had some extra money, so we purchased a green screen, and we had a video camera within our office. So we partnered up and um, were able to to do that, share share equipment back and forth from the extension office to the library when we did our kickoff. So I think some of that can go on as well. Um, that when you start to get started. But we didn't have this list of equipment and the stations at the time when we were um, initially talking about all this. So I know uh, Sherm has thought about the ventilation piece and what pieces of equipment we could get grants for um, originally. But having this list and ha being part of the rotating uh, makerspace, I think, is, um, is going to be able to show people some tangible results. And, and what I would like to do, not only just for this project, but for you know other libraries thinking about makerspaces, is it would be really nice to, because when you look at a list like this, you, and or even if you don't have a list, and you ask the community what kind of machines do we want to have in our makerspace, no, they don't. Know. They, they don't. Know. They don't know yeah, what's out there options, and what they can yeah. do. It would be really nice, for instance, when we get a vinyl cutter or when we go over to the Nebraska Innovation Studio mm -hmm. we go okay what can you make on this vinyl cutter and they say well you can make this that and the other and say well let's make it let's put it in a box okay let's let's do something on your laser cutter make it put it in the box and then you have this box of stuff and you lay it out at a meeting on a table and mm -hmm. say would we want to make anything like this and you go <laughs> yeah hey that's cool well that was done by a vinyl that was done by a laser cutter. That was done by so a finished a, project that people can see. Right, and then it, and then you can start thinking, oh, I, I could do some stuff. <laughs> and I think that's one of the things those inventor showcases are going to do for us, because mm -hmm. we're going to have your local community people who do these kinds of projects and who start thinking about, well, what good is this? Well, I can use. I'm going to be making these for Christmas presents. Well, <laughs> if I'm making them for Christmas presents, maybe somebody wants to buy some for Christmas presents. You know that. Yeah. And I, I could yeah. engrave my logo on these fruit jars, you know. <laughs> yep. Someone wants to know, um, how do we get Connie's help with our community action team? Oh. <laughs> Connie, Is where will you go? How, oh, Connie, how where will you go? go? <laughs> well, that, that, that was the thing I was going to offer. Um, we've got, ex I have visited with uh, many of our extension educators, uh, community vitality educators, as well as our youth educators. So we can, um, locally you've got access to a lot of resources, both from an adult perspective uh, in terms of programming, facilitating these kinds of conversations, um, and from a youth perspective. Um, I was going to offer that if you, if you would like to have some sort of a, a intro to makerspaces, um, Shane Farrader's presentation, I think he would be willing to share that with me. It's already put together. And we could begin to then uh, vision what a makerspace could be in your community. And so we could do a Zoom, we could do this kind of a meeting. Um, if I can't travel face to face or if there's not somebody locally that can do that, um, we could virtually do a presentation with your action team or interested people within your community. So we'd be glad to do that um, and would offer that to um, the folks on the the webinar today so that because it is a it's a hard thing to really conceptualize and once you start to see oh these were things that really were invented and um, these are things that our people in our rural communities probably invent now but they're not giving themselves the credit for and so I uh, would be glad to do a, an intro to makerspace uh, kind of a presentation if that would be helpful we Thank can help you. facilitate that. But also make sure you call your local extension folks. And if, if they, like, are kind of not sure about all of this, have them call me and um, <laughs> we'll, um, we'll be in touch. Mm -hmm. right, great. Um, we have a question about the application process in the stations. Um, in the application process, should we choose or prioritize which stations or mobile stations we would like? Is that part of the application? And do we get only one? Yeah, um, yeah. Each of the four kits are identical kits, and they have it will have all of this in there. So everything you list see in those stations and the mobile stations, you'll be getting. Now, obviously, like Holly says, 
uh, we might decide rather than having that vinyl cutter, we're going to have a different vinyl cutter. Or maybe we find out that the makey makeys aren't quite as good as something else or whatever. So this list could change, but each of those kits are going to have one of, of all you of know, this. have yeah, all, so of all of this is what you get in all one the, kit. In, including the other equipment, which is uh, tools like saws, hammers, PCs, um, extent, uh, extinct fire extinguishers. Hopefully, that's not going to be a problem. But, <laughs> but um, you need to have the, one. The first aid extra, kit. Hopefully, you don't want to need that. So these are all the extra leftover things that will also be included for you. Right. Yeah. Well, we're right. not providing. Might be critical things actually. <laughs> yeah. Iron board. Right. And of course, you see those uh, five laptops there, and that's because uh, a lot of those mobile stations need uh, laptops or iPads or something like that to actually program those items. So, so you, those get, you, won't need to provide you get it, it all. all. Now, there, now it's possible that a library will say, hey, our windows don't open. If you can't bring us a, um, a CNC router that doesn't, or a laser cutter that doesn't need to be vented, obviously we can't use that piece. And, mm -hmm. and if, that's, if, if that's the case, that is fine. Uh, but we're hoping right. to bring all of the this The idea is that we're everybody will have all these, but if there's some piece you, for some reason, you can't get at all that will not disqualify you from participating, we'll just either figure out something or you might just have one less if that's what the ultimate answer right. solution is. Right. Or if you have a 3D printer and say you don't want to take your, you know, you don't have the space for having two, that's fine. We'll just keep ours at home. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Just the one, yeah. But maybe you don't have the 3D scan. scanner. That would be, yeah. Because what a scanner does is if I wanted to, you know, if I have a little trinket and I want to copy mm -hmm. that, you scan it mm -hmm. and then you can make, make it. it from the scanner. We, we couldn't afford a, a body image scanner for, <laughs> <laughs> for the printer or the scanner. And we're, <laughs> we're not sure we want one. Next, next sure. time around, maybe. <laughs> next time around. <laughs> Um, so we have a question about the mobile stations, I think. Um, can a partner organization check out a mobile lab and do courses? Assuming they cannot, I assume you mean Cecilia, like take it out of the library somewhere? Mm -hmm. Like check it out and go somewhere else besides the library building? She said yes. And she assumes they wouldn't be able to charge for those courses. Yeah, Is you know, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling like in, we would probably want to work this out on a case by case basis, but I'm feeling like we really want these to happen in the library. We want this identified as the library program, not the community college program. We love having the community college partner, we love having him work with us on this, but we don't really want this to end up looking like the community college is offering it. But she's, her specific idea actually that she just added is um, specifically their Prairie Arts Museum. Hmm. Well. Well, and it and that could be a good outreach program. You take out the com the robotic yeah. kit. You show your computers. You invite people to come back to the library because you have I all this think wonderful if you're, stuff. I think we're going to be try to be flexible, promoting um, it and saying the library is bringing this to our museum. The right. library, the library, the library, <laughs> and make sure that they know. As that opposed that's to checking coolest. it out to the museum and having them then have it there right. at the museum. Yeah. 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 We'll try and work, work with whatever you, whatever great ideas you, you guys come up with because we know you're going to have the great ideas for how to get this out there. Yeah. And she has one other question, which I'm not interesting. Can people make things on this equipment to sell? Like yeah. to create, to have their own yeah. local yeah. Their own Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So just so like they Joanne what said, they make afterwards is, yeah. if you're making salsa and you want the salsa jars engraved with your logo and your website address, Come on in. You just have to work out jars. at your library what are like how much time does each person get to use the machine and yeah. how long they can you know monopolize it for their project. Of right. Course, I, but I like at Nebraska Innovation Studio when they know that they have a lot of people that use their CNC router or their engraver, they do have um, because they know about how many people need to use that in a given week. Mm -hmm. They do have amounts of time just like you would check out a book or, or a video a where they say yeah. that you can only um, schedule a machine for so many hours during any given week mm -hmm. if 
if you come in beyond those and nobody's using the machine, it's fine to you know mm -hmm. say, okay, now I want to use it because nobody's using it. But uh, so we're going to leave that up to the libraries mm -hmm. because it might be policies. that no one else is using that machine, so yeah. let them have at it. She says time limits, good idea. Yeah, just right. like your computers and things, if you check them out for a certain amount of time, or people can reserve them for a certain amount of time, right. and that's it. Same concept you'd use on these. Yeah, right. Same process. Right. She says actually about letting people sell. She says that is awesome. So you have to <laughs> want it used. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So Cecilia's on board. <laughs> Other questions or comments? Mm -hmm. We have kept you over, and we appreciate we we really appreciate your time because we know that you might not have scheduled to be with us for an hour and a half. Well, I, I will say everyone who um, logged in is still here. Oh, very great, good. Very great. Good. I'm glad and, that worked for me. And there might be times, for instance, if you're selling the items, well, whether you're selling them or just overusing something. Let's say, even though we're supplying the filament because we need a certain quality of filament, sure. if somebody's coming in and making, um, you know, little Pokemon replicas <laughs> and, and they're using up an extreme amount of quality of filament, that there might be... Uh, you might want to. We might have a price that if they're using up five dollars of filament, then they're re reimbursing the library those five dollars. So then we can send the library more filament. Yeah, if you know somebody that yeah. Um, so is I anybody? Think, I think we'll certainly learn a lot through this process. Too. Well, yeah. I guess that's a wonderful thing that Holly just brought up. We certainly don't know it all. This is a learning process for us to find out what works for all of you and and how this can work. And we may work out some of these issues with the first bat round of applicants and then this uh, and then the second one we'll know how everything's supposed to go. <laughs> <laughs> or if we set it up. Does anybody have any other questions? Um, we're not gonna, you know, um, shut down here until we're done with anything any I think desperate you want to ask right now, type it in, you can use your microphone, whichever. And this is also, uh, uh, this slide has Joanne's email and phone number, which is good. And then also the at web address to go straight to that website right. if you yeah. want to just go straight right. to it. And that website, uh, not only do we have the application on there, and by the way, the answers to your questions, there is no limit if you need to answer, you know, use a whole page to answer a particular question. Oh, that's a good point. There's yeah. actually no limit mm -hmm. to how long that application is. Um, and then also that other document that I emailed you is also now accessible from that uh, web page. It's uh, the one with the expectations, the Q&A, and certainly that is a very important document to read uh, because we tried to anticipate some questions that you might have, and so there is some good information. And then the logic document. model was also on there. Yeah, so you could get a better yeah, picture of it. Be able to share. Print it off. Yeah. Yeah. And that uh, that website will continue to evolve because we really did put it up very quickly. So we might mm -hmm. have. I mean, we're going to keep editing it and adding yeah. to it. As far as the paying and charging whatnot. Sherm does say out in Sydney they, that they charge a $5 flat fee for each 3D print job. Mm -hmm. So no matter what you want, five bucks. Mm -hmm. So you can have a, a whatever it's your not. library policy is. Yeah. Be fine with us. So a lot of thank yous. Thank you for the great presentation from Gail Irwin. And Beth Fallis says, thanks, great info. I will have tons of questions as we work through this. Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> tons of questions are That's just okay. fine. There you go. <laughs> yes, and, and, and we invite you to, if you have any questions about the questions on the application, go ahead and at, you know just give me a call and we'll help you work through those. Okay, thanks. Well, Tammy thanks, is excited about this. So we'll, oh, yes. great. Good. I'm Looking glad everybody's to the new potential adventure. We it is an adventure, isn't it? It really is. We're very excited. We were very excited doing the um, library broadband project and this one to me is real Thank similar you. in nature and it was so exciting working with libraries across the state and it'll be exciting all over again. Yeah and fortunately we have our system directors out all across the state and they'll be working right along with us and they'll be a great resources so. And just an appreciation from Nebraska Extension as well that we're a partner in this project because 
I think that the two pieces of local libraries and extension together really have a powerful um, component at our local level. So thank you for including us in the uh, grant. And thank you. Yes, we're <laughs> glad to have you on board. So I guess okay. we'll uh, close. In yeah, it doesn't look like there's any other desperate questions. Feel free, free to ask and through but, this email. Yes. Contact Joanne. Look at the website. Keep an eye on it for updates and changes and whatnot. Good. We're good. All right. All right. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, Thanks, for everybody. attending. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Connie. Um, Thank I'm you. going to actually get out of this back to the website. Here we go. Um, so that will wrap it up for today's show. Whoops, that's not right. There we go. <laughs> So this is the Encompass Live website. Um, as you can see, just Google us and find us online there. Um, today's show is recorded, and it will be, whoops, that's actually the archive sessions page. Let me go to the main page. There's the main page. So usually this is where people go to when they go to first your Encompass Live page. And the archive of today's show will be right here on um, this list. It will be right at the top of the list as soon as I get everything processed and done, probably by tomorrow. Um, Got to go through getting everything up to YouTube, getting this um, uh, presentation up, and that'll be all available to you. And everyone who attended today or was registered will be seen, receive an email to let you know when the recording is ready. So that will wrap it up for today's show. I hope you join us next week when our topic is Tiny Cat Library Things OPAC for Small Libraries. You'll see we don't have a description yet on here because I'm just got this set up last week. Um, library thing, if anyone has used it, it's a place where you can um, ca catalog your own book collection, so to speak, uh, kind of like Goodreads, track what you've got in your, um, at your own house. Um, and, and I have my own account there. Um, they also do things for libraries, though, now they're breaking out into that um, area. And um, Tiny Cat, they've come up with an actual full blown OPEC specifically built for small libraries. And um, Tim Spaulding, the um, founder of Library Thing, along with uh, one of his coworkers, Christy Kennedy, will be with us next week to talk all about that and let you know how you can get um, possibly get Tiny Cat for your library. So do register for that and any of our other sessions coming up here. And Compass Live is also on Facebook. If you have face, if you're a big user on Facebook, give us a like over there. You'll get notifications of when things are coming up. We don't want to set up right now. Thank you. Um, reminders of when our shows are starting, and announcements of when our um, recordings are available. Um, other than that, that wraps it up for today. Thank Thanks, you everyone. Much, everybody. Thanks so much, Connie. Thanks a lot, and we'll see you next time on Encompass Live. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.